Ah, math. The torture of five-year-olds and 50-year-olds alike. The reason why we all had so many sleepless nights as students. No art, a bitch. You're probably watching this video because you are struggling on a math problem. And instead of going back to your textbook and trying more different methods, you want the wisdom of the internet. If that's the case, you came to the right place. I did computer science at Stanford, so I had to do a lot of math, especially in my first two years. And I was never really good at it until I fixed my study methods that helped me in later courses. So if you want to learn how to become good at math from being bad, this is the right video for you. Public safety announcement. At the end of the video, at around the 10 minutes mark, there's a bonus section where I explain a simple step-by-step -step recipe to solve any math problem. If you'd like to watch it, then stick around until the end. Okay, back to the main video. Hi, if you're new to the channel, my name is Sri John, and I love making videos about education, technology, and entrepreneurship. If you want videos on those three things, smash the subscribe button. In this video, I'll explain why people struggle with math, what are the best study habits for math, and how can you ace your exams? Why do people struggle in math? There are really three big reasons why that's the case. First, is the psychology, the second is the experience, the third is the systems that you're using. Let's start with psychology. Math anxiety is a very common thing that most people face. Remember that one math exam where you faced a math problem and you started shivering and you couldn't really think of an answer? That was your math anxiety taking over your body. And instead of thinking on the problem, you started thinking about how you're going to solve it or everyone will think I'm stupid, or all those negative emotions that come flowing through your body. Research says that math anxiety takes away cognitive energy from focusing on the math problem into fear. And that fear and pain makes you do worse at math. So even if you do know the math, you're probably doing worse in tests. The experience. Your early experience in math correlates with how you do well in it in the future. So whenever I ask my friends who majored in math or who went to International Math Olympiad, for example, how is math so easy to you? They always talk about it in a happy kind of way, that they had a teacher who believed in them or they had memories with their parents when doing math and that was a positive memory. So if you never liked math or a teacher looked down upon you or you never had positive experiences with math, it's quite likely that you don't enjoy it and you don't do well in it later. The system. It's quite likely that your systems are not the best for studying math. Think about it. If you're a good student in, say, history, maybe you study everything with the techniques that work well for history. But math is a very different kind of field, especially compared to literature or history. It's very different. So your study techniques need to be different as well. It's quite likely the system that you have for math is just not the right system for improving at math. Let's talk about the second part. How do you improve in math fast? One, most people do not know how to read a math textbook. They read line by line as if it was a normal storybook, like a novel or an English chapter. But really, in math, you should be skimming the chapter. So there are those yellow boxes or red boxes that are bounded by definitions or other important concepts. You should focus a lot on those concepts and not read everything line by line. It's quite common to do circular reading in math, where you read something, then you read something else, and you go back to the thing you were reading before. And that way of shifting again and again is a very common way of focusing on what's important in a mathematical chapter. Learn to read mathematical notation and become fluent in it. Every chapter will have different kinds of notations. And if you're struggling with notations, you will struggle to get the big picture or you'll struggle to manipulate those notations. Also, I think people don't appreciate the scale it needs to do certain things. And I'm guilty of this. When I was doing sales for my first business, I was calling one or two people and was getting really sad that they were not becoming my customers. But the scale at which you need to do sales calls is roughly 100. So for every 100 calls, I'd probably get one customer as conversion. Similarly, most people do math a few times or a few problems, and then they get upset that why they are not improving or why they are still making mistakes. But the scale at which you need to practice is perhaps different. So maybe if you're trying three problems now, increase the scale by 10. Try 30 problems and then see whether you're still struggling. If you used to see three examples before, now see 10 examples, 30 examples. And you see if you increase the scale at which you do things, you'll learn a lot faster. Now, if you look at how machines learn these days, especially neural networks, they do millions and billions of iterations and gradient updates before they learn something simple, like writing a sentence. So you really need a lot of practice on a scale that you are not used to, to improve in anything fast enough. Stress test definitions and try your own examples. Whenever I read definitions, 
I try to think of examples that fit those definitions. I try to do type checking, which makes me think of what are cases where this definition does not hold. And those things are really useful to actually ensure you understand those definitions. The Feynman technique is a very good way of doing this. The Feynman technique basically says that you do not understand anything unless you can explain it back to that of a five-year-old, i.e. if you cannot explain something in simple words, then you cannot really claim that you understand it. It's also similar to active recall, where you recall things from memory, you do not look at notes, you do not use any external consultation, you can just recall things from memory. And the way it's different from memorization is memorization is literally regurgitating things word by word, but active recall is every new time you say it, it will be different, but it will still make sense. So you can use that and try to do active recall on your math problems. Can you say like entirety of your trigonometry chapter, what do you actually cover? If you cannot have a broad picture of what actually was covered in your chapter, then perhaps you still don't understand the big picture well. So try the Feynman technique and active recall to do that. The fourth tip is to not leave gaps of knowledge. And this is very common. Math is unlike anything else because it's contingent. It's built upon one brick and another. That means if you do not understand, say, angles and triangles, you will not understand trigonometry. So to understand something of a higher order, you need to understand things that it depends on. That's why fundamentals are so important. If you don't understand first grade math, you're going to struggle with fourth grade math. And now if you're in your fourth grade or if you're in your 10th grade and you're trying to really ask yourself, oh, I'm studying so much, but why don't I get it? It's probably because you have those fundamentals missing. So I'd really try to diagnose what fundamentals am I missing and go back and revise those things. It's completely okay to go back to your math book from two years ago and really doing it from zero to one and finishing everything. I know math can be frustrating, like you can be stuck at a problem for a really long period of time. What I do is when I'm struggling at a problem for a really long period of time, I close the book and I just look at the solutions. Yep, I just look at the solutions. I try to save my time. And the reason why that helps me is because if you're stuck at something for really long, you become demotivated. You feel like you can't do it. And also, I just want to learn things fast and then I do a lot of practice problems. That's a method that works for me. Now, I want to be very clear. This probably does not work for someone doing their graduate studies in mathematics because they are trying to push the field. But if you're doing applied mathematics or if you're just doing maths in schools, I think you can save a lot of time and do more problems with those save time. So if your goals align with mine, I think that's a good thing to try. I try to divide my studying into three phases, the learning phase, the testing phase, and the reflection phase. And I think most people don't do that and that really harms them. So in the learning phase, I'll use all the resources available to me. That means I'll read the textbook, I'll read the examples, and I'll read tons and tons of examples. Most people probably read one or two examples. I'll probably read 15 to 30. In fact, sometimes I test myself, but the first half of the testing would be in the learning phase. So whenever I get stuck, I'll consult resources like the internet or the chapter I'm reading. In the testing phase, I do not have any external help. I only focus on the problem and I try to do X number of problems in 30 minutes and that's it. And the testing phase's goals can be different. Sometimes it's just to test whether I understand the material. Sometimes I'm trying to do a lot of problems in a short amount of time to check if I'm fast enough for real exams. So in the testing phase, I'm tr just trying to get data of where I am. And then in the reflection phase or the feedback phase, I try to understand patterns of my mistake. Am I making the same kind of mistake again and again? That's a pattern. Maybe I have to revise what I was studying or maybe I have to learn something new. So reflections and feedback is really important. I'd recommend having an Excel sheet for every chapter and regularly testing what mistakes do you make more than once because those are mistakes you will keep on making in your exams. All right, the next section is how do you approach a math problem? In this section, I'll share four easy steps with which we can solve any problem. These are the steps I religiously follow. They are in my muscle memory, and these are partially inspired by an undergraduate guide to mathematics published by Cambridge University. It's an excellent read. I'll recommend it in the description and you should really read it. But whenever I see a problem, I go through these steps. So here we have a toy problem. You can pause your screen and uh, read it. But essentially, I'm writing the goal as I'm reading the problem. So I'm a fence supplier and I want to maximize the fence use. So the goal is to maximize fence used. Also, apologies for my handwriting, but I think 
we can get through this. Um, so the first step will be to identify and analyze keywords that are relevant for the goal. So in this problem, I'll probably identify rectangle, I'll identify length and width, and um, the fact that I have to keep one side unfenced, and I'll have to maximize the fence used. Um, so one concept that's not directly written here that might be useful is perimeter, which is the sum of the sides of rectangle. And also like, as I'm identifying keywords, I often draw doodles to visualize what the problem is about. So I'll have to fence three sides and I can keep one side open. And even here, I'm looking at the problem from two angles. One is either I fence three sides or I keep one side unfenced. Um, then I usually break into sub problems. Here, there isn't really one big problem, so we don't have to do that. But for bigger problems, we might have to break the problem into easier manageable chunks. Then I always think of multiple approaches, and this is crucial. Um, most people try to think of one approach, and when that doesn't work, they get lost, they get math anxiety, or they keep trying that one approach. But it's always easier to think of three, four approaches, and then taking whatever is the easiest route. My high school math teacher, Lindsay, told me to do that, and that was super helpful, so thanks, Lindsay. So here, what are the approaches I can think of? The first approach I can think of is a visual one, that I know what a rectangle looks like. There's a long side and a small side and these have lengths and they have given us the lengths are 8 and 8 and 4 and 4 and what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to take the largest three sides so I know the 8 visually is the largest and one of the fours is the largest so when I sum them up and I know 8 8 4 12 and 4 uh, sorry 16 and 4 that should be 20 so that's a visual one probably straightforward one but if I couldn't come up with this I could have thought of other approaches right I could have thought of um, for example, I can sort the sides from largest to smallest. And then I can select the largest three sides because I am trying to maximize the fencing. So that would be eight, eight, four, and four. And then I will just select the largest three ones. The third approach could be the unfencing one, right? I have to keep one side unfenced. So what if I sort from smallest to largest? I can totally do that. And then I unfence one side, the smallest side, because my goal is to maximize. So I'll just cancel out this and the rest three should be my answer. So that's the third approach that could work here. And if I couldn't think of any of these approaches, I'll think of a brute force approach. I'll think of all the ways I can select three sides and then I'll just exclude one. So in this problem, I can select three sides in this way or this way. And then I sum them, eight, this should be 20, the sum of this is 16, and I know this is the better approach, then this is the answer. So thinking of multiple approaches can really help you if you're stuck. And step four is solving. This is a toy problem, so the thinking of approaches and the solution I did together, but for most things, you can think of them for set. But for most things, you can think of them as separate steps. Okay, I also want to talk really briefly about abstraction and first principles. This really helps me to solve math problems. So abstraction is you just know how to do something and you start from the last step. So if I ask you what is cosine of zero, um, you might just know from your memory that that should be one. But what if you don't memorize what cosine of zero is? How would you think it? You'll use a framework and that's first principles. First principle is you start from a premise and then you build on onto more difficult and conclusions. So the first principle for this can be the unit circle, right? And what that means is I have a circle and I know that goes like this and there's one here, negative one here and same on this side. And I know roughly that the cosine of 30, sorry, cosine of zero should be here. And that looks like one. So even if I don't have the abstraction layer, what cosine of 30 is from memory or from some other logical reasoning, I know for a fact that the unit circle um, looks like this and from this I can deduce what cosine of 30 is. So for many problems you need abstractions like you need to memorize things or you need to know a geometric theorem. But for other problems you can think of first principle, think of the smallest sub problems and then build on to a larger solution. I hope this was helpful.